Good evening. Welcome to Columbia Law School and to our program, What Effect Will the Trans-Pacific Partnership Have on Domestic and International Climate Change Action? The program is uh, co-organized by the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment and the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law and co-sponsored by the Earth Institute of Columbia University. My name is Michael Gerard. I'm on the faculty here at the law school and director of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law. I particularly want to thank Lisa Sachs, the director of the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment, and Mike Berger, the executive director of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law, for their central role in organizing this program. The Trans-Pacific Partnership is a proposed agreement among the United States, Australia, Canada, Japan, Malaysia, Mexico, Peru, Vietnam, Chile, Brunei, Singapore, and New Zealand. It requires congressional approval before it goes into force for the U.S. President Obama supports it, but it has become controversial in both political parties. One of the reasons for the controversy is the question of whether it could limit the ability of the U.S. to take actions with respect to climate change. Um, uh, that is what we're going to explore this evening, as well as any potential benefits that it would have for uh, climate change regulation. We have a distinguished panel of experts who come to this issue from several different perspectives tonight. One of the issues that is receiving special attention is the ability uh, the TPP would give investors who are unhappy with ash action taken by a signatory state to institute binding arbitration. Uh, the concern in the environmental community has been increased by the recent announcement by TransCanada that it plans to bring a claim under NAFTA against the U.S. for denying approval of the Keystone XL pipeline, which would carry oil from Canada to the U.S. Lisa Johnson is going to discuss what the TPP is all about, uh, but first I'll briefly summarize the international agreements on climate change. In 1992, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was negotiated uh, in Rio. It was supported by President George H.W. Bush and overwhelmingly ratified by the United States Senate. It declared the objective of avoiding dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system, uh, but it didn't specify how that would be achieved. That was left to the Kyoto Protocol of 1997. Uh, the U.S. Senate uh, rejected the concept behind the Kyoto Protocol because it did not impose on rapidly developing countries, especially China and India, an obligation to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions in the same way that it obligated the U.S. and other developed countries to. So the U.S. became the only major country never to uh, ratify the uh, Kyoto Protocol. Um, most of the obligations under the Kyoto Protocol uh, uh, expired in 2012, and so in the years leading up to that, there were um, uh, quite a few uh, negotiations uh, uh, to come up with a successor uh, treaty. Negotiations in Copenhagen in 2009 failed, uh, but just last month, uh, a new agreement was reached in Paris. Um, Rather than impose top-down obligations on signatory countries to reduce their emissions by set amounts, as Kyoto did, the uh, Paris Agreement embodies bottom-up uh, uh, commitments where each, almost every country in the world has made a pledge, an intended nationally determined contribution, it's called, uh, for what it will do. Uh, in some cases, it's a matter of reducing their emissions by a certain amount. In others, it's putting on more uh, renewable energy. And so all of these uh, have been uh, put on the table. Uh, they are non-binding. They're not enforceable. Um, and uh, they don't add up to nearly enough uh, to uh, uh, achieve the objective of preventing dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system, but at least we have uh, an agreement. Uh, the pledge submitted by the United States uh, relies primarily on the uh, uh, tightening of the uh, CAFE standards, the corporate average fuel economy standards, which have been in place for some time, and on the Clean Power Plan, which is 
uh, designed to reduce emissions from coal-fired power plants. That plan is in effect, but is the subject of vigorous litigation that is happening now in the D.C. Circuit. Uh, and additionally, the U.S. will have to take additional, mostly unspecified actions. There is one striking difference that I'd like to mention between the climate regime on the one hand and the trade and investment regimes on the other hand. The international climate agreements are for the most part aspirational and not legally enforceable. If a country misses its targets, it suffers no penalties. But under the trade regime, countries can be subject to countervailing duties, which are real, uh, which impose real costs. And investment agreements like the TPP allow disputes to go to arbitration panels whose uh, decisions are genuinely binding and can involve uh, uh, billions of dollars in damages. After that lightning tour of the international climate regime, uh, let me just spend a minute about our format this evening. Uh, I'll introduce each speaker before he or she speaks. Uh, then they will each talk for 10 or 15 minutes. After they're all done, I'll ask them some hypothetical questions about how certain factual situations would be treated under the TPP. After that, we'll open it up to questions from the floor. We will adjourn by 8.30. This program is being videotaped. The video will be posted on the websites of the uh, Columbia Center on Sustainable uh, Investment and the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law. And we will also be tweeting with the hashtag climate PP. I'm sorry, climate TPP. Let me do that again. Hashtag climate TPP. Our first speaker this evening is Lisa Johnson. Uh, she is head of investment law and policy at the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment. Her work uh, at the center centers on analyzing the contractual legislative and international legal frameworks governing uh, international investment and shaping the impacts that those investments have uh, on sustainable development objectives. She focuses in particular on analyzing international investment treaties and the investor state arbitrations that arise under them, examining the implications those treaties and cases have for host countries' domestic policies and development strategies. In addition, she concentrates on key institutional and procedural aspects of the legal framework, including efforts to increase transparency in and legitimacy of investor state dispute settlement. She has a BA from Yale, a JD from the University of Arizona, and an LLM from Columbia Law School. Thank you very much. Um, so it's timely. It's a timely topic. So I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk about the TPP and the connections with climate change. Um, I'll first run us through the the TPP and and what it means before discussing some of the implications that then the rest of the panels will go into in more detail. So the TPP. What is it? Uh, a brief overview is that it is a treaty among 12 different countries that together make up about 40% of the world's GDP. Uh, this treaty is different from other trade and investment agreements that came before it, such as the WTO agreements, in the sense that both the, the obligations are broader, they cover a wider range of subjects, and the obligations are deeper in the sense that some of the commitments are stronger than they would be under the WTO agreements. So in terms of the connections with, with climate change, it's interesting that in these 30 chapters that we now have in the TPP addressing a wide range of subjects and the roughly 9,000 pages that are part of this agreement together with the annexes and side letters, that there's not one mention of climate change in the text. But that doesn't mean that the two are disconnected. The agreement, as we'll discuss, has implications, both positive and potentially negative, for climate change. So in terms of the connections between the TPP and climate change, in terms of one potential positive, we can think about the trade-related implications, and then we can think about the implications of other chapters of the TPP. 
So thinking briefly, starting with the trade-related implications, um, one is that it can be used to facilitate trade in environmental goods and services and to facilitate cheaper access to those goods and services. So if you liberalize trade, for example, in solar panels, you might then increase people's ability to access solar panels on the market at a cheaper rate than they would be able to access if they were just limited to the domestic suppliers. However, there can also be negative impacts of increased trade rules in, in the TPP on climate change. One example of a potentially negative impact is that increased trade in and of itself can result in increased G greenhouse gas emissions. So the more you have goods being transported around the world, being shipped or flown around the world, the more emissions that can result. Another potential increased uh, negative effect could be to the extent that you liberalize trade in fossil fuels themselves, you can potentially ex uh, increase use of those fossil fuels, which then can re lead to an increase in uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And then a third example of a way that, that liberalization of trade can have a negative impact on climate change is that you might have the rules of free trade, um, because free trade is not just about free trade, it's also about the rules governing trade. The rules of free trade themselves might tie the hands of governments in their ability to address climate change issues. So one example that's often discussed is, let's say you wanted to, as a country, restrict imports of products that were produced using a method that resulted in a lot of emissions of greenhouse gases relative to products that were produced domestically. One question is whether or not you can do that under the rules of, of free trade. So those are some of the trade-related impacts, both positive and negative, that can result from TPP. In terms of investment-related impacts, and these are the impacts that I'll focus more on, because um, that's the area that the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment focuses on, is on international investment. So first off, what do we mean by international investment? What is international investment covered and protected by the TPP's investment chapter? Essentially, international investment refers to the activities of multinational corporations. There's a company in the US, it wants to establish an affiliate abroad, that is international investment. It establishes a foreign affiliate in another country. So that's kind of the archetypal type of, of international investment that's covered by the investment chapter. Now, the aim of the investment chapter, which is typically stated, is that countries conclude investment chapters as part of their free trade agreements because they want to increase the flows of capital between countries. They want to enable and encourage the activities of multinational corporations to establish affiliates in other countries, for example. Um, so that's the, the, the goal. And there are said to be some purported benefits that, that can flow, that don't necessarily flow from increased investment, but those include increased well, capital, flows of capital, flows of money into countries, uh, increased job creation, transfers of technology. There are different benefits that are said to flow from uh, increased investment. So that's the, the goal of the chapter. So increased investment can have positive investment-related impacts on climate change. One is that they can be used in promoting investment. You can promote investment in renewable energy. Uh, you can get new technologies into countries that want those technologies, for example, technologies in solar power or in wind energy. Investment-related implications, you can use an investment treaty potentially to reduce investment in fossil fuels. And you can, again, use investment treaties to encourage transfer of, of cleaner technologies. But there are also some negative implications that you can, depending on the design of your investment treaty. One is that in addition to or instead of increasing investment in renewable energy, one impact is that you might have increased investment in fossil fuel development. Um, you could also, as, as Mike mentioned with the investor state arbitration mechanism, you can increase government exposure to litigation and liability for taking action to address climate change mitigation and adaptation. So for example, if a government denies a permit to a coal-fired power plant, there is a potential that that can trigger a claim under an investment chapter. So those are some of the issues that I'm going to be discussing, how the TPP's investment chapter performs on some of these issues, that both the positive and the negative potential implications for climate change. So. This is my scorecard of how the TPP, I would say, ranks on potential positive impacts 
on investment in climate change mitigation and adaptation. And I would give it a zero at best on what it could have done. Um, so in terms of it could be used to promote investment in renewable energy. As I said, investment treaties, the aim is to encourage international investment. Uh, but the main way it seeks to encourage international investment is just by saying we'll protect investors from government conduct. So far, the studies that have done, been done on investment treaties have shown that there's no correlation or causation between signing an investment treaty and getting increased investment. So there's no guarantee that more investment will come, much less investment in renewable energy. Now that said, some countries when they've signed investment treaties have actually included provisions in their investment agreements saying that we will cooperate to identify projects that can uh, fall under the Kyoto Protocol's clean development mechanism, or we will cooperate on identifying opportunities for cross-border investments in renewable energy. So the EU-Singapore Free Trade Agreement and its Trade and Sustainable Development Chapter, it has some of those provisions. The agreement between Japan and Mexico also has some of those provisions. The TPP has none of that, so there's no mechanism for trying to promote investment in renewable en energy. Uh, another thing the treaty could do is it could try and reduce investment in fossil fuels. Uh, one way a treaty can do that is the agreement, again, between the EU and Singapore. It has a commitment that the states will reduce the use of subsidies and will work on reducing use of fossil fuel subsidies. There's no such provision in the TPP on commitments to reduce subsidies, much less any discussion of fossil fuel-related subsidies. It could also be used to promote transfer of cleaner technologies. Um, some agreements, there's a Cotonou agreement, which is a development agreement that has investment-related provisions between the EU and African, Caribbean, and Pacific states. And that has provisions where the state parties work together to collaborate on transfer of technology. Uh, this doesn't have any provision on facilitating transfer of technology, much less clean technology. Instead, it contains a provision saying host states, the states receiving investment, can't use any provision that requires transfer of technology from the foreign investor into the host state. So there's provisions actually limiting transfers of technology. So in terms of whether the TPP leads, uh, fulfills a promise of promoting investment in climate change mitigation strategies, I would say it doesn't, it doesn't live up to its potential and represents a missed opportunity on that score. In terms of potential negative investment-related impacts, I would say on the scorecard here, we see that there are some potential negative impacts. Um, the TPP, the way it's drafted, I see that it can, it can increase investment that will keep us on a current trajectory of a fossil fuel-based economy. And the reason why I say that is that it's protections that are provided to all investment equally. Um, so it, it allows, it provides protections, essentially free political risk insurance to investments in the extractive industry sector, for example. So for new exploration and exploitation of natural resources, for new developments of fossil fuel uh, power plants, fossil, fossil fuel based power plants. So irrespective of the impact of a particular project on climate change mitigation or adaptation, the treaty provides support to those investments. And I think it's interesting to contrast this with political risk insurance that's provided by another US agency, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, where what they do is they actually try and restrict investments in, uh, in projects that will, re that will increase GHG emissions and also restrict uh, certain support of projects that have other environmental implications. Now, there's no such limits in the TPP. Again, it applies to any project, provides its benefits to any project, irrespective of whether it actually exacerbates climate change. And again, the idea behind this is it's supposed to promote those investments. So we're inadvertently then seeking to promote investments in, in increased fossil fuel development and, and other types of projects that, re that release greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the second point that I would say is that the TPP can expand government exposure to litigation and liability for actions it's taken in order to mitigate emissions or to adapt. This is something I'll, I'll talk about briefly and then I think Ben will talk about it in, in more detail. But this is through the ISDS mechanism, the investor state arbitration or investor state dispute settlement or ISDS mechanism that's included in investment treaties. 
So what is ISDS? Um, very, very briefly, ISDS is a, it's a mechanism in, switch, it's a, it's a mechanism that's included in investment chapters that provides foreign investors really a unique and powerful tool in international law. When a foreign investor doesn't like a measure that is taken by the government and believes there's an argument that the measure violates the treaty, the investor can sue the government directly in arbitration. Now you contrast this with the WTO when disputes or allegations of treaty violation happen on the state to state level. Um, so states decide whether to bring a case. Here the investor can bring the case directly. So really in international law, this is a very unique mechanism. And in contrast to human rights law, the investor doesn't have to exhaust domestic remedies first. It can go straight to arbitration. And we've seen a significant rise in this field of law over the past 15 years from relative obscurity with no cases um, before, I mean really uh, under 10 cases before the 1990s to now we've got over 600 cases that have been filed. So why, is, why does it matter? Now it gives foreign investors a very privileged mechanism through which to sue governments and lawsuits can be based on action taken by any branch of government. So it would be legislative, uh, judicial, or executive. And at any level of government, whether it be a local level action, a state level action, or a federal level action. Um, and it can be, it does, as I said, you don't need to exhaust remedies. So even a lower level administrative decision can give rise to an investor state challenge. So how is this different? Um, from what we have under the status quo. I mean, as anyone who follows kind of climate change strategies in the US knows that when the government tries to do something to regulate emissions or govern development, often there will be litigation that's prompted. And so the Sabin Center on Climate Change Law collects a resource, for example, that lists different climate change related litigation in the US. So the notion that investors and companies will challenge government efforts to address climate change is nothing new, but what is new is that this provides a new mechanism, an additional mechanism for foreign companies to challenge government action. And with, the, with this mechanism, so when investors choose this mechanism, the substantive protections that are provided under this mechanism are, according to the research that we've done, stronger than what is provided under domestic law. So you could frame potentially a, a case of a substantive due process violation, for example, under domestic US constitutional law and have a very small likelihood of success. Or you could frame your claim as a violation of the fair and equitable treatment standard, which is incorporated in investment treaties and have probably a better likelihood that your claim will succeed. The procedural rules in investor state arbitration tend to be more favorable to foreign investors and less favorable to states. Um, the exposure to costs and litigation is also significant. Uh, the average ISDS case now costs about $8 million to, for, to proceed, um, about $4, four million for each side. And there are costs, these costs are both to the US and then to other TPP parties. The US has said, there, there's been a lot of controversy over ISDS, and the USTR has said, the US Trade Representative's Office, has said that the TPP addresses some of these issues and it prevents frivolous claims or unmeritorious claims against the government for public interest actions that are taken um, for legitimate purposes such as climate change regulation. And I would say that the TPP actually doesn't solve these issues, that the substantive and procedural standards essentially remain the same from what we've seen before, that arbitrators, the people who decide these cases, they have significant power to interpret treaties in a way that they deem appropriate, which has been with the overriding goal of protecting investors' interests. Um, there is a right to regulate provision in the TPP, but in order to be protected by that provision, any government action has to comply with the treaty. So it's essentially a self-defeating exception. There's a tobacco carve out in the investment treaty chapter, which essentially says that governments, even when they're taking good faith action designed to address a public an issue of public importance such as tobacco, um, that claims can't be brought under ISTS for such, ISDS for such measures. And I think that carve out for one particular area of public policy illustrates that other important areas of public policy remain 
unprotected and subject to ISDS claims. So some people have suggested a similar carve out for climate change related actions, but there's no such carve out in the TPP. Um, and cases, we have recent cases such as BillCon, which is against Canada and TransCanada, which Michael mentioned. I won't go into those, but they illustrate the risk that governments can be sued and successfully sued um, for actions taken to address uh, environmental issues. So I think that that is a signal of what can be expected in the future. So to conclude, I would say that considering how the TPP misses opportunities to tackle the challenges of climate change and poses risks to government policy in this area, can we say that the TPP is truly a 21st century trade and investment agreement? And I would say that the answer is no. We can't say that it's a 21st century 20, uh, trade and investment agreement because of its approach to climate change. Thank you. Uh, so our next speaker is Noreen Kennedy. She has served since 1991 with the U.S. Council for International Business, where she is now Vice President for Strategic International Engagement, Energy, and Environment. She promotes U.S. business participation in international environmental policy and management initiatives and works closely with industry, government, and NGOs to promote sustainable development and green growth. She also spearheads the Council's Strategic International Engagement Initiative, which seeks to advance meaningful business participation and regulatory diplomacy in intergovernmental inter organizations and focuses on increasing accountability of international institutions regarding business interests. In addition to staffing the Council's 120 Company Environment Committee, she represents business and environmental discussions at the uh, UN and OECD. She was a business observer at the UN's 1992 Earth Summit in Rio and served on the U.S. delegation to the Rio Plus 20 Summit in 2012. She regularly participates in meetings of the UN Environment Program and UN deliberations on the Sustainable Development Goals and post-2015 development uh, agenda and negotiating sessions of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. She holds a master's degree in international environmental policy from Claremont Graduate School and a bachelor's degree in international relations from Wellesley College. Well, first, uh, I want to thank the organizers for the invitation to come and speak to you today about the UN Paris Climate Agreement and the TPP. Um, I'm going to have a slightly different perspective from the previous speaker. It won't surprise you to hear. Um, and I guess I'd like to start with uh, some sort of broad over overarching points. The first is that the two agreements that we're talking about, the UN Paris Climate Agreement and the TPP, I would say both of them are too important to fail. They both are at risk of being political footballs. Indeed, they've already become political footballs, and yet they're both really critical to sustainability, and therefore we really need to uh, see them reach a successful ex uh, acceptance and implementation. And then my second point is they are better together than they are apart. Um, they need one another, actually, to be uh, successful. And I'll make that point in my brief comments. But just to react to s some of the things that I heard from the previous speaker, I mean, first of all, if one were to ask the question, can the TPP solve climate change? I think, you know, it's very easy to say no, indeed not. Um, but then if there were a second question, which is can the Paris Climate Agreement succeed and a and meet the objective, the uh, ambitious objectives that governments agreed last month in Paris without open trade, I think we would as emphatically say no. So I will um, just say a few words about what USCIB is because we're not a well-known no organization. I'll talk a little bit more about the Paris Agreement, the, the Paris Agreement vis-a-vis -vis trade, 
the Paris Agreement vis-a-vis -vis the Trans-Pacific Partnership and then look ahead. And I'd like to kind of provide the context that Robert Acevedo, uh, the Secretary General of the WTO, offered uh, last month before the Paris Climate Summit, and that is that we don't really have a zero-sum game here, and we don't see trade as uh, exclusive to climate protection or vice versa. What we're seeking is a virtual circle of reinforcing policies. And I would just say that if you look at the track record of agreements in December and did a scorecard of climate change and the Paris Agreement versus open trade and the Doha round, you'd have one in the climate um, count and right now, unfortunately, an, a zero in the open trade count. So I think that that's indicative of many things, including how broadly accepted um, and what, a, what an international, strong international consensus there is to address climate change. So about USCIB, the U.S. Council for International and Business, we are a U.S. business advocacy group. We're unique in that we focus on international policy. We promote open markets, sustainability, and corporate responsibility formed by U.S. companies in the global marketplace. And we tend to favor multilateral cooperative approaches and policies rather than unilateral measures, especially for transboundary challenges, such as climate change, among others. And we have a very broad membership, mainly U.S.-based global companies, Fortune 500, as well as associations and professional service firms. This is a picture of some of the connections we have into the intergovernmental arena, affiliations that we have as a U.S. business group with the International Chamber of Commerce, which is our entree to the U.N., through the International Organization of Employers to the ILO, through the Business and Industry Advisory Committee to the OECD, as well as directly in our own right on a ho whole host of issues. And I think that this slide really just shows that our perspective is a global, engaged perspective, uh, focusing on the importance of business being involved across the board in, in all kinds of important economic and sustainability challenges. Um, I also uh, have the logo of the Major Economies Business Forum, which is a group of national business organizations that have been following the climate change negotiations for years, if I may say, even decades. Um, so USCIB has a very, very broad involvement in a, in a wide range of policy discussions, but for the purposes of today's panel, we'll talk about trade and climate change. And um, you'll see that there are some common chords uh, on trade. We represent U.S. business in the World Trade Organization, the Environmental Goods Agreement, in TTIP and APAC. USCIB has a seat on the U.S. Trade and Environment Policy Advisory Committee, TPAC, and I'm the Sherpa from my boss to TPAC. We're strong supporters of TPP and the Environmental Goods Agreement. And just a quote from a, one of our policy positions that uh, some of the key measures that are uh, behind our support for TPP include that it strengthens labor and environment provisions. I can say that in the 25 years of working at USCIB, that, that we come out and say that explicitly is quite a step forward in progress. And I remember um, early days in both trade negotiations, such as of NAFTA, as well as environmental agreements, that there was much less alignment and integration uh, in the U.S. business community uh, around these issues. But I think it's, it's quite extraordinary that we could say as an organization that uh, one of the reasons that we support the TPP is because it strengthens labor and environment pr provisions and is a major step forward. Similarly, on climate change, we've been representing the U.S. business community at the UNFCCC since 1993. We're strong supporters of the Framework Convention and the Paris Agreement. I'm still riding a little wave of euphoria after the Paris meeting last week. And uh, we've said many things on climate change, but for today, I think it's important to say that successful climate policy and its implementation requires supportive frameworks, not just inside the UN Framework Convention, but also outside. An economy-wide approach, a regulatory approach across every arena. Um, in terms of the Paris Agreement, one thing that I think is important to recognize about it is that it is about as authoritative an agreement as you can have. It was broadly, is broadly supported across all UN member states. It's the recognized center of gravity of a vast global framework of climate and energy relevant accords and initiatives. 
the UN post-2030 development agenda and sustainable development goals, the Partnership for Access to Sustainable Energy for All, G20 on fossil fuel subsidies. This list could go on and on for several slides. So I think the ta one takeaway from this slide is that there is actually uh, a meeting of the governmental minds about the centrality and importance of climate change action across the board. And so maybe one takeaway that I would offer is that this is a further signal of convergence across governments. We don't have some of the doubtful and even adversarial uh, intergovernmental discussions on these issues than that we had 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And so that bodes well, that hopefully bodes well uh, looking ahead. But the Paris Agreement is not enough by itself. Um, there are tremendous expectations raised in meeting both the national, the INDCs, but also the international goals for mitigation and adaptation, and those rely heavily on private sector investment and technology as broadly deployed as possible to as many developing countries as possible. And so the enabling frameworks for investment and trade, including the TPP, but not limited to the TPP, actually matter a lot. Um, I, I mean, you could pick numbers out of the air. Here's a, an international energy agency number, um, about 44 extra trillion dollars over you know, uh, the next uh, up until 2050 to meet the two degree C limitation target, and that's not even thinking about the 1.5 limitation target, that's further down the road. So we're talking about mobilizing something like a trillion dollars a year. And so it is actually quite important that trade, including in environmental goods and energy, is actually given as much of a jump start and as much of a catalyst as is possible. And, and trade agreements really matter for that, and particularly trade agreements that think the way that investors think. So this is a, a, an incredibly important vehicle for the way that these necessary technologies, these cleaner energies are going to be broadly deployed. Trade agreements are critical infrastructure for climate policy and implementation. Um, and, and it's not just the TPP, but it's a, a, a broader constellation of trade agreements as well. Um, the way we see the TPP is that it is a chance to set an influential approach for reinforcing economic and climate uh, policy and action that involves major emitters in Asia and Latin America, that it brings together important producers and customers for cleaner technologies and energy, and that in fact, it does do more than just ISDS. There is a chapter on investment, but there are other chapters as well relating to capacity building, relating to regulatory coherence. And so actually when we step back and look at the broader TPP, we see that there are other opportunities to strengthen and upgrade uh, environmental regulation and its implementation. But of course, this is not going to happen without decisions in, import in the United States and other countries to actually commit the adequate resources for um, capacity building in the environmental arena, including on climate change. Um, now, I could step back and look at the Paris Agreement and many of the climate negotiation texts and make the same observation that was made just a little while ago that there's no mention of trade in the Paris Agreement. There's no mention of business in the Paris Agreement. There's no mention of competitiveness or very little mention of investment in the Paris Agreement. And yet, that's not surprising because it's a climate agreement and we expect it to really focus on climate. Um, whereas when you look at the TPP, which is a trade and investment agreement, you actually see a very, very broad set of topics that are brought in and, adv and, and advanced uh, beyond just trade and investment. Um, in our view, TPP improves on and goes beyond environmental protections in previous trade agreements. I can remember, because I was at USCIB at the time, the negotiations of NAFTA and its environmental side agreement. And some of the things that we talk about now as, as givens as, and as assumed are, you know, now in fact ingrained in the uh, agreement itself. It may not mention climate change, but it does refer to low emissions and resilient uh, economy. It also talks about illegal trade in flora and fauna, biodiversity, marine species protection, eliminating fisheries subsidies. The point is that there's a lot more in the TPP 
uh, that actually does take a step forward on environmental protection. Uh, and, and for that reason, we think it actually does need to move forward. It does include commitments by all parties to eliminate tariffs on environmental goods. Uh, there are also measures that provide improved public transparency and recourse on environmental issues. I've already mentioned regulatory coherence. This is an opportunity to harmonize environmental rules upward, as well as references to partnerships and other kinds of capacity building. So um, just to close, I would say that TPP is more than a nice to have for climate action. It is a must have. The two agreements, as has been observed, have a lot in common. Neither of them are perfect. They, have, they both have a long ways to go, both in further elaboration and in their proving their worth in um, actual implementation. But they are part of this bigger picture of climate-friendly economic activity, development, and growth. Um, they both will rely on and need to enlist business to deliver. And seen through the sustainability lens, both of them, whatever their failures or incomplete nature, are steps forward. We really do have to avoid the perfect as the enemy of the good critiques in these settings. And these are both very important issues for sustainability, and therefore they should not be allowed to become political footballs. There are opportunity costs uh, for failure, and we feel that the opportunity costs for failure of either the Paris Climate Agreement or the TPP would be profound. Um, I just am allowing myself one word for ISDS, and that is that providing the opportunity for recourse for discriminatory or unlawful government action will, in fact, attract investors and investment, and it's important to have that happen, including for climate-friendly investment and particularly for developing countries. So for us, that is actually uh, not a bug, but a feature. Uh, and with that, I just will conclude, and those are websites for both USCIB and its climate change page. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ben Beachy, who is Senior Policy Advisor with the Sierra Club's Responsible Trade Program. Uh, ben investigates the implications of U.S. policy for environmental protections, including efforts to co combat climate change. Formerly, Ben analyzed the impacts of U.S. trade policy as Research Director of Public Citizens Global Trade Watch and as a Nicaragua-based policy analyst and D.C.-based national organizer for